few minutes early, but we'll start with announcements this morning. And that's no indication that my sermon is long. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome. Uh, to, and the sunshine is out, and I uh, hope all of you didn't hurt yourself or injure yourself with all the snow we received plowing out. Um, but indeed, the sunshine was glorious yesterday, wasn't it? Really lovely to enjoy after all of that snow. So welcome to our service of worship this morning. It is indeed good to see you. I hope you plan to stay after for some coffee and conversation this morning. Uh, thanks to Fred and Diane for getting that organized this week. Uh, and we look forward to having a time together. We're actually having it right upstairs, so you don't have to go anywhere. Is that correct? Yes, right upstairs. And uh, it'll be in the back. You can help yourself. You're welcome to come back in and sit with some friends and chat uh, and, uh, and reconnect with one another. Uh, we continue with our accessibility training, and for the next several weeks, probably leading right up to Easter, Petrus compiled some bulletin inserts for us. Uh, this week we're looking at accessibility barriers and also some myths and reality statements. So I invite you just to take those, and this is kind of a little educational journey that we're on together. The board has had its training, uh, and just a way in which we can learn to be more accessible to all people. Here at Netflix. So please take note of that. Uh, yesterday I had the privilege of sitting down with the Heard family, uh, and they are quite a bunch of wonderful people, and we had the opportunity to, to share memories of them um, and of Hilton. It was, and we discovered that it was hard not to share memories of one without the other. Uh, all the stories were of them together, and they were married for over 70 years. And um, up at the front this morning are two little elephants. Um, Bev was a collector of elephants, and uh, we went back to her room after talking at Tranquility Place, and there's a little ledge all around the room, and on it are all kinds of elephants. And the family invited me to take a couple. Uh, and so they are here at the front this morning as we remember her. And give thanks for uh, just uh, a note to uh, make sure that you have on your calendar our annual meeting, which is coming up. There's going to be some um, uh, some important discussion at that meeting, so uh, please make sure that you are there. And uh, Dave Proctor moved that we have a potluck lunch. So we're having a potluck lunch uh, in between worship and the meeting, so please bring something to share, and uh, we will have the meeting immediately following that lunch on the 26th. Are there any other announcements? Uh, this morning, uh, our prelude as we gather our hearts in worship is uh, a song, I believe it's called I Will Sing. But you will notice in the third line that it says alternate lyrics by Annie Savard. And Annie's taken this song and adapted it to fit with our Lenten theme, Cultivating and letting go. So as you listen to the lyrics, I invite you to ponder what we talked about last week as we offered up to God those things that we're going to let go of during the season of Lent. And you can see in our messy church last week, we uh, folded those into hearts and birds and they are hanging on our Lenten tree. And today as we talk about the things we're going to let go of, those will fall to the ground as leaves and we will add the things that we're going to cultivate together during Lent. So I invite you to prepare your hearts for worship as we hear our music team sing song.
Never again will we be exactly in this place with these same hopes and these same prayers. Never again will we be exactly in this place with these same hurts and these same dreams. So as we gather together in this place, may we bring our hopes and prayers and dreams. May we bring our hurts and wants and needs. To the God of this day, to the God of this place, for surely God is here. Let us worship our King.
modern paraphrase of Psalm 27, and I invite you to join with me responsibly. The Lord is my light. The Lord surrounds me like a warm, familiar quilt in layers of grace. Shall I the Lord is the sturdy foundation and the roof over my head. I am not afraid. When the world is at its worst, when grief clings to my bones, when fear eats at my confidence, when loneliness moves into my house, God sets the table, turns on the lights, and invites me to dance. So even though there are days that feel like too much to bear, I know I am not alone. So I ask the Lord, I seek and I pray, let me live in your house all of my days. This is God's word for us this morning. Thanks be to God. I'd like to share with you this morning the parable of the trapeze. And this parable speaks of the transformation of life that we all encounter at different places and different spaces in our life journey. And it's a parable that invites us to consider turning the fear of transformation into the transformation of fear, of cultivating our resilience in the face of adversity and challenge and change in the midst of the void, and the letting go of the powerless to change and Sometimes I feel that my life is a series of trapeze swings. I'm either hanging on to a trapeze bar, swinging along, or for a few moments in my life, I'm hurtling across space in between trapeze bars. Most of the time, I spend my life hanging for dear life to my trapeze bar of the moment. It carries me along at a certain steady rate of swing, and I have the feeling that I am in control of my life. I know most of the right questions and even some of the answers. But every once in a while, as I'm merrily or not so merrily swinging along, I look out ahead of me into the distance and what do I see? I see another trapeze bar swinging toward me. It's empty and I know in that place in me that knows that this new trapeze bar has my name on it. It's my next step, my growth, my aliveness coming to get me. And in my heart of hearts, I know that for me to grow, I must release my grip on this present, well known bar, and move to the new one. And each time it happens to me, I hope, no, I pray that I won't have to let go of my old bar completely before I grab that new one. And for some moment in time, I must hurtle across space before I can grab onto the new bar. Each time I'm filled with terror, and it doesn't matter that in all my previous hurdles across the void of unknowing, I have always made it. I am each time afraid that I will miss it, that I will be crushed on unseen rocks in the bottomless chasm between the bars. I do it anyway. And perhaps this is the essence of what the mystics call the faith experience. No guarantees, no net. No insurance policy, but you do it anyway because somehow to keep hanging on to that old bar is no longer on the list of alternatives. So for an eternity that can last a microsecond or a thousand lifetimes, I soar across the dark void of the past is gone and the future is yet to be. And that is called transition. I have come to believe that this transition is the only place that real change occurs. I mean real change, not the pseudo change that only lasts until the next time my old buttons get punished. I've noticed that in our culture, this transition zone is looked upon as a no thing, a no place between places. Sure, the old trapeze bar was real and the new one coming towards me, I hope that's real. But the void in between, it's that just a scary, confusing, disoriented nowhere that must be gotten through as fast as and unconsciously as possible? No, for that would be a wasted opportunity. 
I have a sneaking suspicion that the transition zone is the only real thing, and the bars are illusions we dream up to avoid the void where real change happens and the real world occurs for us. Whether or not my hunch is true, it remains that the transition zones in our lives are incredibly rich places. They should be honored and even savored. Yes, with all the pain and fear and feelings of being out of control that can, but not necessarily accompany transitions, they are still the most alive, the most growth-filled, passionate, <coughs> and expansive moments of our lives. So I invite us this morning, to, as we consider what it is we are letting go of this Lent, to listen to the stories from the trappings this morning people who find themselves in the world. And as we do this, we're going to <laughs> sing a new spiritual song called Guide My Feet. This was new to me. Uh, and I, I showed it to Rebecca and she said, oh, we sang that all the time at Conrad Grable. So she knew it, which was great. So I invite you, um, as you get to the tune in your head, to sing along with the worship team. We'll be doing this several times. Did you want to play the two ones through first? Sure. That would be helpful. Thanks. Thank you.
it said that God has adopted us to be God's own children. How can this be? Why would God want someone as lacking as me? I'm sure, not sure what it means to be your child, O Lord. I, I don't know if I measure up. Certainly I don't measure up to Christ. Sometimes I feel hopeless, discouraged. I need your presence and your love. You have called me your child. You've given me the name Beloved. I, I guess I am your child, Lord. I am yours. Today and tomorrow, and on the third day, 
I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. <coughs> Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This is God's word for us this day. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us stand together as we are able to sing the care the evil gives for young. what his love 
compels him to do. And in doing so, he cultivates a resilient, faithful heart. So how do we, living in the light of Christ's example, cultivate resiliency in and through our very lives? Resilience is defined as the capacity or the ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune, difficulties, or change. The ability to cope with and recover from setbacks. People with psychological resilience are able to use their skills and their strengths to respond to life's challenges, whatever they may be. Instead of falling into despair or hiding from issues by using unhealthy coping strategies, resilient people face life's difficulties head on. And one of the guideposts to wholehearted living that Brene Brown offers in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, is cultivating a resilient spirit and letting go of our powerlessness. Brown discovered through her research that the number one common element in the lives of all the people she interviewed who were resilient was their spirituality. Not religion or theology, but spirituality, and she defines it as this. Spirituality as recognizing and celebrating that we are all inextricably connected to each other by a power greater than all of us, and that our connection to that power and to one another is grounded in love and in compassion. And that practicing that, practicing spirituality, brings a sense of perspective, meaning, and purpose to our lives. Embracing the existence of a higher power opens the door to more love and compassion manifesting in your life. So as a Christian people, we have a really good start and guide. We believe that it is Jesus who connects us and unites us as his body of love and compassion in the world today. And through following in his way, as we build relationships in community, as we develop our purpose for living and our identity in God's naming of us as his beloved, and grounding all we say and do with gratitude and with awe for all of God's gifts and creation, with all of that in place, we have been given all the tools to build a resilient, wholehearted life. Grounding ourselves in the faith and belief that we are created for a purpose and that God is with us through all of the joys and struggles of this life, we are given courage to persevere through the void and allow God to transform our fears with hope. And it's interesting to note that Brown discovered in her research that people with a strong spiritual foundation also possess one of the most essential building blocks of resiliency, and that is, in fact, hope. And I think many young people today find themselves feeling hopeless and without direction or any sense of purpose, and then are not resilient to the disappointments and struggles of this life. Not just young people, but a lot of people. I wanted to share with you this research that um, Brene Brown cites in her book by a researcher by the name of C.R. Snyder. And C.R. Snyder contends that hope is not an emotion, but rather a way of thinking or a cognitive process. And that means that hope is a choice. And he also noted that hope is learned. So, in simple terms, hope happens when we have the ability to set realistic goals. So you can say, I know where I want to go. I have a hope, I have a dream, I have a goal. And then next, hope comes when we're able to figure out how to achieve those goals. 
including the ability to stay flexible and develop alternate routes because we know that sometimes the way we want to go is not the route that we're sent on. So I know how to get there, I'm persistent, I can tolerate disappointment, and I can try again, but that is my goal, and I want to get to that point. And finally, the third element of hope is that we believe in ourselves. I can do this. Hope increases resilience because it shows you that things won't be tough forever. It reminds you that you can achieve your goals and improve your life. And our scripture is filled with the reminder and the promise that our hope is in God who is with us along the way. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. We read in the 10th chapter of Hebrews, Let us hold strong to the confession of our hope, never wavering since the one who promised it to us is faithful. As I said before, having hope doesn't always mean that life will be easy, and I know that every single person in this room knows and has journeyed through life that life is not always easy. Brene Brown contends that we develop a hopeful mindset when we understand that some worthy endeavors will be difficult and time-consuming and sometimes not enjoyable at all. <clears throat> Hope also requires us to understand the opposite, that just because the process of reaching a goal might be fun and fast and easy sometimes, it doesn't mean that it has less value than a difficult goal. If we want to cultivate hopefulness, we have to be willing to be flexible and demonstrate perseverance. And not every goal will look and feel the same, and tolerance for disappointment, determination, and a belief in self are all a part of hope and resilience. The Apostle Paul echoes this thought in his letter to the Romans. Jesus leads us into a place of radical grace, where we are able to celebrate the hope of experiencing God's glory. And that's not all. We also celebrate in seasons of suffering because we know that when we suffer, we develop endurance, which shapes our characters. And when our characters are refined, we learn what it means to hope and anticipate God's goodness. And hope will never fail to satisfy our deepest need because the Holy Spirit that was given to us has flooded our hearts with God's love. So whether we're overcoming adversity or surviving a trauma or dealing with stress and anxiety or having a sense of purpose, meaning, and perspective in our lives allows us to develop understanding and move forward. Without purpose, meaning, and perspective, it is easy to lose hope, to numb our emotions, or become overwhelmed by our circumstance. But the heart of a spiritual life is connection. For when we believe in that inextricable connection to God and to one another, how can we feel alone? Feelings of hopelessness, fear, blame, pain, discomfort, vulnerability, and disconnection will sabotage our resilience. The only experience that seems broad and fierce enough to combat a list like that is the belief that we are all in this together and that something greater than us has the capacity to bring love and compassion to our lives. And I would add to that to unite us even in our differences. So what might a resilient spirit look like? Resilience is saying, yes, I can in the presence of those who doubt us. Resilience is standing tall rather than hanging our heads and shuffling away when the invitation to give up beckons. Resilience means never succumbing to the forces of defeat that may be all around us, and there are many in our world today. Resilience means believing there is a path that has been charted for you and staying on it even when you stumble. It means not letting failure or criticism deter you from 
from the willingness to try again and to move forward regardless. It means letting the past be the past, rather than allowing it to control the present to forecast the future. It is a decision before it's anything else, and then it's a commitment to execute the plan. Resilience is a trait that can be honed by all, but is avoided by many because of the fear of failure. And resilience is getting up again and again, even when it falls. My friends, that love and connection that we hold fast in our lives is Jesus Christ. In the way he lived, in his sacrifice on the cross, and as he rose again with the promise of new life, even after death, we are given hope that all things have the possibility to be made new. So let go of your self-doubt, those feelings of powerlessness you cling to, and invite Jesus to cultivate within you a resilient, hope-filled spirit. Because I'm pretty sure Paul, in his letter to the Romans, is, is pretty clear when it comes to this. He tells us to love others well. And don't hide behind a mask. Love authentically. Despise evil. Pursue what is good as if your life depends upon it. Live in true devotion to one another, loving each other as sisters and brothers. Be first to honor others by putting them first. Do not slack in your faithfulness and hard work. Let your spirit be on fire, bubbling up and boiling over as you serve the Lord. And this is so important. Don't forget to rejoice. For hope is always just around the corner. Hold up to the hard times that are coming. And devote yourself. Now to him, who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we could ever ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus for all generations.
Trust in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Friends, our lives are blessed with the goodness that comes from God. So let us trust that goodness to sustain us and so offer our gifts to share with the world in need. With our glad hands. Let us pray. Faithful God, you have kept your promises to us and our lives give witness to your abundant blessings. And so may we faithfully keep our promise to you Strengthen our commitment to live as true disciples of Jesus Christ. Your love sustains us, guides us, empowers us, and offers us hope. Take these gifts as signs of our promise to give ourselves completely into your care, to let go of our fear in order that we may cultivate our trust in you and in your love without reservation. In Jesus' name we pray.
Thank you for the energy to focus on the things we can do day by day, putting our love and care to work in community and in creation. By the power of your spirit, bless us with the insight and passion to act in hope. And may your wisdom guide us in all things. We ask you now for daily strength, for hope for tomorrow, for your word to guide, and strong feet to follow. For the psalmist says, Show me your ways, O Lord, and teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. God of the oppressed, we bring to you the broken ones, the forgotten ones, the exploited and abused ones. Bring freedom and release, love and compassion to damaged hearts and souls. God of compassion, hear our prayer. God of the distress, we bring to you the grieving ones and hurting ones, suffering and wounded ones. This morning, we especially pray for those who are facing health issues at the moment, for those struggling with mental health, for those struggling with physical health. We lift up to you in prayer, Ed and Laverne. We pray for the hurt family who grieves the loss of death, and we are grateful for the gift of her life within our community of faith. We, we pray for those who are caregivers during this time, that they may be sustained with the strength to help and to carry on. Bring wholeness and healing and comfort and relief to broken bodies and minds, God of compassion. Hear our prayer. God of the dispossessed, we bring to the lonely ones, the homeless ones, thirsty, tired, and penniless ones. Bring hope and sustenance, physical and spiritual food to hungry bodies and souls. We are grateful for the gifts of this congregation who offer in February and in March as our Lenten journey food for the hungry. And we pray for all those who, through the outreach of the Burford Food Bank, may receive this food and be nourished, and in turn know that others love and care. God of compassion, hear our prayer. And now we bring all of these prayers to you, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And our closing hymn this morning is Tree of Life and Awesome Sword. Let us stand as we sing together.
now we leave this space of worship, and while so much of the road ahead is uncertain, and the path constantly changing, we know some of the things that are solid and sure, as the ground beneath our feet and the sky above our heads, we know that God is love. We know Christ's light endures the darkness. We know that the Holy Spirit is there, found in the space between all things, closer to us than our next breath, binding us to each other until we meet again. So go in peace, my friends, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.